Higo, and I am the uh, chair of the Steveston Japanese Canadian Cultural Centre Advisory Committee. I am honoured to be your co MC for this historic event, along with uh, MLA Kelly Green. Salish peoples. To begin our program, we will have a performance by the Taiko group Chibi Taiko. Thank you very much, Chiba, Chibi Taiko drummers, for the wonderful performance to start our event today. This morning, we're excited to be joined by the Honorable Premier John Horgan. Give a wave. <laughs> the Honorable Ratna Singh, BC's Parliamentary Secretary for Anti-Racism Initiatives. And I'd like to acknowledge the following persons who will be speaking later in the program. Naomi Yamamoto, former MLA for North Vancouver Lonsdale. Thank you. 
Elders Mary Kitagawa and Aki Hori. Laureen Oikawa, President of the National Association of Japanese Canadians. Wave, Laureen. Suzanne Tabata, Project Director for BC Redress, over here. Mary and Cecilia Point of the Musqueam First Nation. And local resident and community member, Jim Kojima. We're here to mark the 80th anniversary of the traumatic internment of thousands of Japanese Canadians to honor their legacies and support future generations in the community. Not only is this year significant for Japanese Canadians, May is also Asia, Asian Heritage Month, and Monday marks the start of Anti-Racism Awareness Week in BC. It is a timely occasion to honor the Japanese Canadian community and reaffirm our commitment to dismantling racism in BC. I'd like to uh, begin by introducing Jim Kojima to provide a welcome in Japanese. Jim? Konnichiwa. Horgan, BC, Shicho. Uh, Chiji. Steveston ni kite kurete arigato gozaimasu. Mina sama isogashi tokoro o kite kurete arigato gozaimasu. Horgan, BC Chiji no hanashi o kite kurasai. Arigato gozaimasu. Thanks very much to my good friend Jim. Oop, I'm throwing my mask. <laughs> um, as the MLA for Richmond Steeston, I am so honored to be here with all of you. I'd also recognize um, some of the dignitaries that we have here. We have Minister Nathan Cullen, we have the Attorney General David Eby, MLA Henry Yao, Minister of State George Chow, Minister Ralston, Parliamentary Secretary Rajna Singh, Parliamentary Secretary Bob Deeth, and MLA Susie Chant. And from our local government, we have Mayor Malcolm Brody, Councillors Bill McNulty, Andy Hobbs, and Alexa Liu. And it's apt to be holding this event here today in the Steeston Martial Arts Centre, which has served as a centre for martial arts in the area for 50 years. First opened in 1972, it was the first dojo in the world to be built in the traditional Japanese architectural style outside of Japan. It's a beautiful building and a fitting location for today's announcement. And we are joined by people and communities right across the province via live stream. And I want to give a special shout out to those of you joining us from viewing parties in Burnaby, Nanaimo, New Denver, Hope, Victoria, Vancouver, and so many more neighborhoods across our beautiful province. Thank you for joining us and welcome. And to get us started off in the right way, I'd like to invite Mary and Cecilia Point of the Musqueam First Nation to offer a land acknowledgement. Hi, Chika. Hi, Chika. Uh, hi, Chika, uh, Jim. Each while, Ohayo gasayamas, konnichiwa, hello, bonjour. Asiem nesieya, asiem nesieya, and the Mary Point, tenitsina komatquiam, ami tsep kotquilam, ikla kotanesieya, my skakat, Cecilia Point. In the language of my ancestors and in the language of my very best friend from high school, uh, I said hello uh, and I uh, welcomed you. My name is Mary Point. I'm from Musqueam. I live in Richmond. I grew up here my whole life along with my sister. 
and I'm very, very pleased to be here today, uh, asked by a dear friend of ours, um, my best friend in school, uh, Kiyomi Nishimi Nakamoto, her father, Kiyoshi Nakamoto, served in the Canadian military, but was also interred in the interior. Something I could never get my head around, uh, but these were the government decisions of the day. And so I'm very pleased to be here today to acknowledge and honor him and all of those who were on that journey. As well, I just want to share a little bit of our history. Um, in Musqueam, my family, my great-grandfather, Manette, my great-great-uncle, um, Tiakpet, our family grew up over here in Steveston uh, in what we called the village of Kwayak. When the visitors came, they couldn't say Kwayak, they couldn't say Manette or Tiakpet, uh, but they renamed the area as the visitors of the day did back then. And it is now named after one of Captain Vancouver's officers. Um, it's called Gary Point. And we, because they couldn't say our names, became known as the Indians at the Point, and eventually as the Points. And that is how we got our last name <laughs> here in this society. Uh, so government decisions were made that affected all of us back then. And I'm very pleased to just stand here where my ancestors once stood, where they walked and thrived, uh, where they made good family connections, such as my dear friends, the Nakamotos. And, um, and I want to honor all of the lives that were lived here. And I want to be sure that we remember, that we stand on their shoulders. They paved the way for us to be here today. Uh, I'm going to share a song after my sister speaks, and I just want to say it's our Musqueam Paddle song. It's a song that we sing when we're entering a new community to let people know that we're coming with good intentions. It's a song that we sing standing on our shores to share a little bit about who we are. It's also a song that we sing at the beginning of any journey, uh, a wedding, a funeral, a graduation, or days like today when this commemoration was a long time coming, a big journey. Um, and so uh, I'll also sing it for our children uh, who uh, are still being unearthed and accounted for across the nation. Uh, and I'll also sing it for all of those who come to this country looking for a better life, the refugees uh, that we welcome at the airport every day, uh, and the Ukrainians, of course, who are on the journey of their lives right now. But for today, this song will be dedicated to uh, the memory, our loving memory of our friends and family. You know, my son goes to school in Richmond, and at the beginning of his high school year, he was asked to do a project of where did your family come from and when did they get here? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, at first, all respect to the teacher for acknowledging that people didn't come from here. Uh, but second of all, that's when he started digging into our history and learned that uh, we were actually removed as well from Steveston. Uh, probably around the same time the Japanese were removed uh, because we had a village at Gary Point and as my sister said so we were removed because all natives had to go on to reserves or they would be arrested and they couldn't leave the reserve uh, without a ticket without special permission so uh, there's a little house at Britannia shipyards called Point House you can learn a little bit about our family there but I really want to raise my hands, Rush Messing, for your anti-racism work. It's very important. I've learned so much from you and your husband and from Naveen. Uh, you know, they taught me about uh, the Komagata Maru, a Japanese ship, bringing uh, South Asian people here, and again, they weren't welcome here. So our paddle song is also sung because our canoes used to go out. We'd sing our paddle song and greet everyone who came. So in closing, I just want to say, when we would go out and greet visitors, we would ask them, are you coming here in a good way? And our Japanese friends came here in a good way and were treated much the same way as us. So we stand in solidarity with you, solidarity.
We hope you'll always stand in solidarity with us. Osiem. raised, uh, my hands raised to honor you and to thank you. Haitzepka, uh, thank you one and all. Thank you, Mary and Cecilia, for that powerful welcome. Today's announcement will support those who were directly impacted by the government's actions during the Second World War which led to 22,000 Japanese Canadians being forced to leave their homes and livelihoods behind. I now like to invite the President of the National Association of Japanese Canadians, Laureen Oikawa, to the stage. Established in 1947, the NAJC has a long history of advocating for the community. They negotiated the historic redress settlement that former Prime Minister Brian Mulroney signed in September 1988 and continue to push for healing and acknowledgement of the harm caused to the community. Laureen? Thank you, Kelvin. And thank you for that warm Indigenous greeting. Um, I raise my hands to First Peoples, who for time immemorial are the traditional keepers, stewards of the lands and the waters where we live and work and learn and gather. As you heard, the National Association of Japanese Canadians was founded in 1947 to help strengthen the Japanese Canadian community and to work for justice. On behalf of the National Executive Board, I want to thank the Japanese Canadian community 
and our member organizations for their incredible support. So many have contributed since we first started on our journey in 2017. And I, and I see you. I know you're at viewing parties and perhaps at home surrounded by family. We are connected. Since the 1800s, our ancestors have built their lives and contributed to communities. They faced discrimination and many challenges, but they worked hard and they were thriving. And then 80 years ago, in 1942, the world came crashing down for them. 22,000 approximately, from babies to seniors, were forcibly uprooted, stripped of their homes, property, possessions, incarcerated, and exiled. It wasn't until 1949, four years after the Second World War ended, that they were released. And they had nothing, and they had to start over. And they did. This is very personal. This is my family. It's your families, past and present. But it's also tied to our future. We need to honor our elders. We need to hear the stories from survivors, learn about the history of our ancestors, learn about the injustices. We must place the highest price, a priority on a just society, especially in times of crisis. We must ensure no other group of people is ever unfairly targeted. We have a role to play, but it's not just our community. Thank you to Premier Horgan and the BC government for taking meaningful action. Thank you. Thank you, Laureen, for your continued work to advocate for Japanese Canadians, not only here in BC, but across Canada. Next, I'd like to introduce Honourable Rachna Singh, BC's first Parliamentary Secretary for Anti-Racism Initiatives. In this position, she's been leading government's work to dismantle systemic racism and recently introduced the historic Anti-Racism Data Act, new legislation that will help to make government programs and services better for more people. Welcome, P.S. Singh. Thank you so much, Kelly and Calvin, and hello, everyone. I'm so grateful, grateful to be here on the territory of the Coast Salish people. I really want to thank Mary and Cecilia Point uh, for your words and also reminding us that how our histories are connected. As BC's first parliamentary secretary for anti-racism initiatives, one of my mandate priorities is to honor the Japanese Canadian community by redressing the historical wrongs of the internment data. It has been one of, the, one of my great privileges to listen and learn from survivors and their families, to hear their first hand, the devastating and long lasting impact of this dark racist chapter of our history. In 1942, more than 90% of BC's Japanese population at the time were relocated or interned by the provincial and federal governments. Given only 24 hours notice to leave, many moved away from BC and never returned. I've heard about how Canadians were stripped of their property and possessions, forced to relocate, sometimes back to Japan, a country they had never known, where people speak a language they did not understand. This racist policy broke apart families, tore people from their culture, and forced thousands into unsafe working and living conditions, causing long-lasting health complications. The government of the day stated that this was for national security. This racist policy stripped many Japanese Canadians of their dignity and self-worth, and resulted in intergenerational trauma that is still impacting so many of them. I carry these stories. I have heard from the Japanese Canadian community in my heart. They remind me how this community has turned their trauma into action. Action to honor the legacies of their communities and action to educate people far and wide on this historical wrong and the lasting impacts of systemic racism. We must acknowledge the part that the provincial government 
played in what happened to these thousands of men, women, and children. Before, during, and after the World War II, the provincial government seized the opportunity to advocate for the removal of nearly 22,000 Japanese Canadians from the West Coast, to advocate for their incarceration in the province's interior years after the war end, to, uh, to push for the confiscation and forced sale of all their property, and even held weekly auctions of all Japanese Canadians' belongings. We owe it to the survivors and their families to make sure something like this never happens again. As we work to build an anti-racist British Columbia, that means calling out racism whenever and wherever we see it, no matter how uncomfortable it is. We recently introduced the anti-racism data legislation co-drafted by First Nations and Métis leadership to shine a light into the dark places where systemic racism lives in government programs and services, with data that reaffirms that we have been hearing from the communities so that we can make change and address racism in a meaningful and lasting way. To the elders and everyone who has shared their experiences with me, I'm so honored to be trusted with your truth. We will never let your stories fade. And I want to thank the National Association of Japanese Canadians for working alongside us for so long. It is extremely tough to place your faith in deeply colonial system that denied justice to you so many times over. Please know that we will continue to work alongside you as we make lasting change to honor your legacies and your ancestors' legacies and ensure that this dark chapter and history is never forgotten and is never repeated. Thank you so much. Thank you, Parliamentary Secretary, for your continued work to address discrimination and racism in this province. The BC government is working alongside communities to, the, to deliver meaningful and lasting changes to long-lasting colonial policies. The National Association of Japanese Canadians is an excellent example of what's possible when community unites with one common purpose. Our next speaker can certainly attest to the power of community all moving in the same direction. Suzanne Tabata is the director for the NAJC's BC Redress Initiative and one of the driving forces behind today's event. On a personal note, I can't think of any better person to represent us than Suzanne, uh, because over the last couple of years, she, uh, I've come to know her as very, very knowledgeable, but more so tenacious. And I, I pity the poor government who's had to deal for the last uh, several years. So, Suzanne. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker Higo. <laughs> Uh, we are here today as witnesses to honour with great thanks our elders, past and present, and in recognition of their lives lived, share with you the process we have undertaken to honour our legacies. Before I start, I must respond to Cecilia and Mary's remarks today. Our family, too, is from Gary Point. I pause to reflect that 80 years ago today, my father arrived in the Caslow internment camp. He was born in 1925, about 100 yards from where we are sitting today. And he was raised on what is now Gary Point, on a property where my great uncle's boat works thrived as a business and supplied boats to the native fishing community as well. He was taken from his friends, his school, and his community vanished. Today, 80 years later, he sits in this room. <clears throat> also a witness to this historic occasion. Thank you. We thank you, Premier Horgan, 
for engaging with our community and appreciate the unprecedented ministerial attention given to this BC redress proposal, a due, due process, as Parliamentary Secretary Singh has alluded to, that was denied to all Japanese Canadians in the 1940s. We also extend our thanks to Honourable David Eby, BC's Attorney General, under whose ministry this work has been carried out, and to you, Parliamentary Secretary Singh, who has broken new ground with anti-racism initiatives along with your staff and officials who have led this work on behalf of the Government of BC. Thank you. For the past three years, we have worked together with the broadest range of the Japanese Canadian community members to build out a series of initiatives which responds to feedback in our community consultations report, which responds to input from our organizations and groups, and above all, which listens to our elders and voices in the community who have no platform to be heard. So we are here today on their behalf. In doing this work with the community, your government has listened. There is a duty of care to our surviving elders to ensure they can live out their lives with dignity by receiving health and wellness supports. And we thank you for funding the Nikkei Seniors Healthcare and Housing Society with a $2 million grant to begin this process of providing health supports to our survivors. Our team led by ACO Eby, backed up by Kathy Makahara, Ruth Coles, Linda Reed, and others, and powered by volunteers in all areas where survivors lived, have paved new ground, and we have concluded there are great needs with our seniors in this population. In doing this work, we have found that descendants of our entire coastal population of Japanese Canadians still carry the trauma of this history, and we know that there is work ahead to address this intergenerational trauma as part of this healing. And we thank Dr. Karen Kobayashi from our community, whose work has broken new ground in looking at internet intergenerational trauma. In doing this work, we have found that the erasure of the Japanese-Canadian community resulted in the loss of identity that is still felt today. Our surviving elders deserve to know that their experience matters and that their shared history will never begin, again be repeated. This means, of course, public education. And we thank Masako Fukawa and her perseverance for continuing this work in this area. Our community has spoken. We must do the important work to recognize the many places we are, we are connected to. Communities across BC where we lived, loved, raised families, worked, and built our future. There is a growing call for heritage restoration sites where all local histories can be shared in a public interpretive learning spaces. Standing here today, we acknowledge, above all, the teaching of our elders. I wish to thank Paul Correa, who is online today and has COVID and is unable to attend, for your continued support as you would be standing here alongside myself to share our thanks for all those who have given us lessons. I also wish to thank Justice Marika Omatsu, the first East Asian judge in Canada who led the community consultations in 2019, along with Arthur Miki the lead on the federal redress. I acknowledge you. You inspire confidence to us to continue to do this work. It is also important to acknowledge, of course, community members who are joining us today who rallied behind this work. It takes activism to bring about change and it takes organizations to implement programs and services and we are all here today. And so, as witnesses, we can confirm that the due process denied to our community in 1942 
has indeed been granted by this government and that through thorough community consultations, we built these initiatives designed to provide the community with specific material improvements that redress the enduring harms of the internment era. And on behalf of the NHAC, the people in this room, and all of our elders, past and present, we thank you for continuing to walk with us. Thank you, Suzanne. I appreciate very much your dedication to this important work. Next, we're honoured to have Naomi Yamamoto with us today, a former MLA. Naomi made an informal apology to the Japanese Canadian community on behalf of the BC Legislature in 2012. She's a passionate advocate for this community. Naomi. Thank you. Um, you know, it was just 11 years before I was born that the Canadians of Japanese descent actually got the, again, the right to vote, just 11 years before I was born. Um, and then 60 years later, um, I was elected as the first Canadian of Japanese descent uh, to be elected to the Legislative Assembly of British Columbia. And that was quite an honor. And I, I think about, <laughs> thank you. And I, and I think about what Mary said, Mary Point said, um, about standing on the shoulders um, of our ancestors. And I, I certainly stood on a lot of shoulders uh, to get to that point. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, so then we had 70 years um, in 2012. That was the anniversary of the internment of the Japanese Canadians. And I got this email from, from Tosh Suzuki. And uh, Tosh just said, you know, it's 70 years. Maybe we should do something. And uh, an apology would be appropriate, you know. And this is the actions of one man. His MLA, um, former MLA, uh, was Guy Gentner of North Delta, and he said, "Well, you should probably contact Naomi, and you know, I'm I'm going to support you all the way." And uh, and then 80 years. So now it's 10 years past that. 80 years today, you know, celebrating another anniversary. And celebrating is kind of an odd way to 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 describe it. But I just want to thank my sister Donna. Yamamoto and my cousin Michael Teraguchi to be witnesses for our family for this um, occasion. Uh, so Tosh sent me this email and he said an apology from this government um, for actions of the former government would be appropriate since it's 70 years. And I'm kind of thinking, well, this is, this is March. May is when the legislative calendar was going to end that year. But you know what made it work is we had the um, absolute support from both sides of the houses and and um, Adrian Dix was the leader of the opposition at that time I met with him he gave his unqualified support of himself and his caucus I had the support from um, our side of the house and I think about that spirit of cooperation I, that's one of the highlights of my um, my, my years in uh, Victoria so on uh, in May of 2012 at the fourth session of the 39th Parliament a motion of apology was passed unanimously um, by both sides of the house. Um, I would like to also mention the work that Roy Inouye did as well uh, from Kamloops. Um, he unfortunately has passed away. But there are so many folks, so many people who were impacted by the internment and regrettably have passed away now. In fact, the majority of the people, including my dad and mom. And uh, my dad just passed away last year. He was uh, 94. He had lived a good long life. Um, and he would be proud of this day as well. So we're talking about legacies and you know what people left behind and I think about the value of the, um, the wisdom, the experience that have been passed on to us and for me I can describe it in two words and that's resilience and perseverance. Um, we can take that with us so I thank you all for all the shoulders that we've been able to stand on and thank you to the government of BC for continuing to honour the legacy of the Japanese Canadians in British Columbia. Thank you, uh, Nami, for your advocacy for Japanese Canadians. I'd next uh, like to call upon two of our elders, uh, first uh, Aki Hori and then followed by Mary Kitagawa, two internment camp era survivors. Aki was forced to move with his family out of their home in Vancouver to a camp in East Lillooet. Upon his return, he joined or entered UBC 
and graduated medical school in 1960 and practiced medicine for 48 years from 1961 to 2009. And I think they need you back, Aki. <laughs> Along with his brother Louis and Bruce Tisaka, uh, as well as many other volunteers, Aki was instrumental in construction of the East Lillooet Interment Site Memorial Garden, which was officially opened May 7, 2022. And I think many of you would probably have been there. Mary is an educator whose experience has shaped her journey as an activist for social justice. In 2018, she was awarded the Order of British Columbia for her efforts to advocate for Japanese Canadians. One of her advocacy initiatives resulted in UBC uh, uh, conferring honorary degrees in 2012 to 76 Japanese Canadian students who were expelled in 1942. I call upon uh, Dr. Hardy to make his remarks. Premier Hargan, Parliamentary Secretary, thank you all for coming today. I would like to say a few words about racism and what happened during the internment during the Second World War. I'm going to have a short comparison between what happened in the United States and in Canada. After Pearl Harbor, there was a very racist general by the name of John DeWitt, who was a commander of the military on the west coast of the United States. And he and very racist senators from the three western states coaxed the president, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, to pass an executive order 9066 that allowed the government to intern 120,000 Japanese Americans to internment camps in 10 different states. In 1944, several Japanese Americans challenged the government to say that they have violated the American Constitution. And the Japanese Americans won in the highest court of the land, the Supreme Court of the United States. This led to the Roosevelt administration to say that we'll allow the Japanese Americans to return to the coast, West Coast, as early as January 2nd, 1945. Now that's way, way before the war ended. In Canada, in comparison, over 22,000 Japanese Canadians were interned. About uh, 20,000 pe people went to government-supported internment camps, and about 2,500 Japanese Canadians went to six different self-supporting camps. In the beginning, shortly after the war started, uh, military leaders such as uh, Major General Kenneth Stewart, uh, officials of the RCMP in Ottawa, the Canadian Navy, they all influenced or advised then Prime Minister William Lyon Mackenzie King that the Japanese Canadians were not a security risk to this country. However, racist politicians, especially MPs from the Fraser Valley, New Westminster, Vancouver, Vancouver Island, Comox, Alberni, that area, they were able to coax the Prime Minister that the Japanese Canadians were a security risk to the country, and thereby we were interned and we were labeled enemy aliens. 
and not only uh, uh, till 1945, uh, we were labeled enemy aliens and kept like prisoners of war in our own country till 19, April 1st, 1949, when we were finally allowed to return to the West Coast. In 1945, the war ended, and with that, the so-called security risk also ended, and the Japanese Canadians should have been returned to the West Coast at that time, but racism prevented that. In 1945, the Canadian government said to the internees of the government-supported camps that you have two choices. One choice is that you may go to, you may be uh, voluntarily be deported back to Japan with your Canadian-born children and 4,000 people dead get deported. The second choice was that you must go east of the Rockies. Now, what does that mean? It means that BC hates you. We want to get rid of you. And I uh, have a newspaper clipping here, and I, I would like to read a portion of an editorial of an article written by a famous, a well-known journalist by the name of John Mackey of the Vancouver Sun. And he wrote this article, Vancouver Sun, dated March 7, 2015. And it tells you everything. So this editorial stated, and I, I quote, the Vancouver Sun has repeatedly pointed out that during 50 years of Oriental immigration to this continent, British Columbia has consistently fought against the Japanese infiltration. And just as regularly, we have been overruled by Ottawa. Now, for excellent military reasons, the Japanese army are being moved inland. Can anyone blame us if we hope that by May Day we shall have seen the last of them, and for all time? We shall have to admit that we are gladly using a necessity of the war to give us a solution a permanent solution, if possible, of an immigration that was thoroughly distasteful and objectionable. John Mackey, at the end of the article, states, ironically, the editorial ran under a slogan stating the Sun was a newspaper devoted to progress and democracy, tolerance, and freedom of human thought. And I want to say a few words about the worst racist politician of the time. And his name is Ian Alistair Mackenzie. He was a Scottish immigrant who came to Vancouver in 1914. And in 1941, he was a minister of pensions and health in the cabinet of Mackenzie King. And I will quote, uh, read what he said. Quote, it is the government's plan to get these people out of BC as fast as possible. It is my personal intention, as long as I remain in public life, to see they never come back here. Let our slogan be for British Columbia, no Japs from the Rockies to the seas. With just one last final quote, 
There's a Professor Henry Yu in the Department of Asian Studies at UBC, and he was quoted last year as saying that if the Japanese Canadian internment had occurred in present times, it would be called ethnic cleansing. I will end here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Hori. Um, can I have Mary come forward? I don't think these podiums were made for <laughs> munchkins like me. I could see you. <laughs> uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for this opportunity to speak. My name is Keiko Mary Murakami Kirigawa, one of the few survivors of the incarceration. I was born on Salt Spring Island, and my parents were Kasiori and Kimiko Okano Murakami. Honorable Premier of British Columbia, Mr. Horgan, I met you at Government House in Victoria when you presented me with the Order of British Columbia in September of 2018. <laughs> I am truly grateful for that honor. Today, as a survivor of the cruel journey that my family, my grandparents, and 22,000 Japanese Canadians who were forced to take, I would like you and your government to learn about our suffering. I think you already know. Yes, we lost all that we owned, fishing boats, farms, businesses, homes, contents of what was in our houses, vehicles, and cameras. Fishing boats and farm businesses were our means of earning a living, which were stolen from us. Orders and councils, which were passed one after another, made this possible. It was legalized theft. In order to limit the number of Japanese immigrants entering Canada, the Hayashi Lemieux Agreement was signed in 1908, a year after the riot that destroyed Chinatown and Japantown by a mob of white supremacists. It was euphemistically called the Gentleman's Agreement. By the time my father entered Canada in 1927, only 150 men, Japanese men were allowed into Canada. The BC politicians were espousing racist comments as far back as 1922. Here is a quote from Alan Webster Neal, MP for Comox, Alberni, in the House of Commons. It is, better to f is it better to fight now when Japan controls only one half of British Columbia or leave the fighting until 10 years hence when she will, by peaceful conquest, have absorbed the whole of British Columbia and have thousands of her trained troops scattered throughout British Columbia and other provinces beyond the Rocky Mountains, end of quote. In spite of the military and the RCMP declaring that Japanese Canadians were not a threat, the BC politicians continued their racist tirade at every opportunity. Here is a quote from Ian Alistair McKenzie, MP for Vancouver Centre and the key figure in the decision 
of uprooting Japanese Canadians. Uh, Aki has already quoted that, so I won't repeat it. Another quote from George Buscombe, Vancouver City Councilor. We want all of their properties sold, the same as their fishing fleet. We don't want Japanese to return after the war. They are going to outbreed the whites and eventually outnumber us. On January 8th and 9th, 1942, a conference was held in Ottawa called the Japanese Problem. To me, it sounded more like blame the victim conference. In attendance was Lieutenant General Maurice Pope, who was the military staff officer of Prime Minister Mackenzie King. In his book, Soldiers and Politicians, he wrote, when I agreed with the RCMP and the military that Japanese Canadians did not pose a threat to the security of the nation, all hell broke loose. I was afraid that the BC politicians were going to charge across the table to manhandle me. The rage was a sight to behold. One BC delegate conceded privately to him that the war afforded a heaven-sent opportunity to rid themselves of the Japanese economic menace forevermore. Lieutenant General Pope said that he left that meeting feeling dirty all over. The intangible losses are seldom mentioned in the narrative of our history. Those losses impacted our lives just as devastatingly. We lost our community where we had a strong sense of belonging. We lost our language so that we could no longer converse with our Issei elders. Many lost their opportunity for an education like my oldest sister. We lost our plans for a brighter future. We lost our ability to pass on intergenerational wealth. Many, like my grandparents, lost their enjoyment of a retirement for which they worked a whole lifetime to achieve. Many, like my parents, lost their most productive years of their lives. Some elderly parents lost hope and committed suicide. In memory of those, excuse me, I would like to thank, thank them for their courage, their perseverance, sacrifices, and strength of character that allowed us to prevail. I would like also to thank all the members of our community who worked so hard to honor the 22,000 brave souls by making this day happen. And I thank the government of Mr. Horgan for listening and hearing so that this day could happen. So thank you very much. Thank you both for those powerful words. Um, we are very grateful for you sharing those experiences and recollections with us. Your stories are going to stay with us for generations and help us to raise awareness of the historical wrongs committed against the Japanese Canadian community. This is truly a monumental day for Japanese community, Canadian community and we have MLAs with their communities across BC including Minister Murray Rankin, Minister Josie Osborne, Minister Sheila Malkinson, Speaker Raz Chan, MLA Janet Rutledge, Minister Rob Fleming, Parliamentary Secretary Brenda Bailey, MLA Kelly Patton, and Minister George Heyman. And now I'd like to invite the Honourable Premier John Horgan to say a few words.
Thank you very much, Kelly and Kelvin, for uh, such an admirable job of uh, emceeing a, a day that is a very solemn day, but also, I hope, a day of celebration as we turn a page in what has been a challenging history in British Columbia. And I, I lift my hands to, uh, uh, to all of you here today on Coast Salish territory, and particularly to Cecilia and Mary Point for getting us started in a good way and, and reminding us that, uh, that uh, their elders were displaced and taken from their lands. Their elders were, were told that they were not the same as those who were coming after they'd been here since time immemorial. And I think that is a foundation for a discussion today and a celebration of turning a page with respect to how Japanese Canadians have been treated by successive governments over many decades, as was articulated so well uh, by our speakers. But it is um, Monday will be a, a year since the discovery of 215 unmarked graves in uh, Tekemlup Shawetmuk territory in Kamloops. And uh, Mary reminds us that um, our history is not well told. I have two degrees in history, and I was not made aware fully of the impact of residential schools until uh, I lived, I was in a gymnasium, not unlike this room, with survivors who talked about generational trauma, who told me their stories, and that then became real. So the legacy items we're talking about today with respect to the impact on Japanese Canadians is one I think that is long overdue. Although uh, it is a terrible chapter in our history, there is a history of internments. And all you have to do is, is talk to people who can celebrate the, uh, the docks at Steveston or, or in Euclid or on the West Coast uh, where vibrant fishing fleets were the dominant economic driver for British Columbia. Japanese Canadians, Japanese born here Canadians doing all of that work. You need just walk down Powell Street today to see the remains of what was a vibrant commercial and residential area that was taken away without redress, taken away without anything other than a you don't need to be here anymore. 80 years ago, the first Japanese Canadians who had had their families uprooted, uh, incarcerated, forced from their homes, their businesses taken away from them, left for New Denver, they left for Caslo. They left for places that they may never have heard of, and for years they remained. This is a history that we have to not just tell on anniversaries, but has to be instinctive to all of us in this generation and the generations to come. And that's why when we talk about cruelty and racism, as we heard so ably from, from Aki and Mary, their lives touched and tarnished by policies of racist governments in our past, it adds to my pride in the work that uh, Attorney General Eby and Parliamentary Secretary Singh have taken on on behalf of all of us to do what we can to draw attention to these moments in our history that need to not just be touched upon, but be ingrained in generations that come after us. I lift my hands to uh, Naomi. It's fantastic to see you again. And I remember full well that day in, in, in 2012 when Tosh uh, was able to convince us all to come together and do what should have been done decades before building on the work that Art Miki and, and the federal government did in 1988. But when I was approached by, uh, as a government by Lorene and Suzanne and Paul Korea, and Paul, you need to know you've got your own square on Hollywood Squares here. We're live streaming to your living room right now as well. But when they came and spoke to, uh, to the government and said that uh, the, the apology in 2012 took us a, a good distance to uh, reconciliation, it did not take us all the way. And legacies from the internment, legacies from properties stolen, lives diminished, lives cut short, as Mary says tragically, because of the hopelessness of the circumstances of people like all of us, just people, told that they were not as good as Caucasians. Absolutely abhorrent today, but those values lived still in British Columbia, in Canada, and around the world. The rise of anti-Semitism, the rise of racism throughout the COVID pandemic remind us how important the work we all have to do together. Anti-racism means when we see hate, we speak up. We stand together as we stood together today, as Mary stood with her Japanese friends so many years ago. It's building relationships 
that allow us to put down permanent legacies for the challenges that we have experienced as a government. I've been to the, the Nikkei uh, Museum in Burnaby several times. It's powerful, it's moving, and for those who have not yet been, I encourage you to do so. I was in uh, New Denver just this past summer to see the need for that facility to be refurbished so that the story can continue to be told, not uh, here in the Lower Mainland where lives were destroyed, but in those places where lives persisted. Uh, you know, I, I was invited by Paul to an Asahi event uh, a few years ago. So I learned I'm not a baseball guy. I'm a Star Trek guy, and I'll get to George Takei in a minute. But um, I'm not a baseball guy, but I became an Asahi fan. And just shortly after that event, uh, Paul will, remind, will remember uh, the Canadian moments of how important the Asahi were uh, to the sport and to the people of British Columbia at that time. And to see the team going off to travel, a new team, a team of a different generation, it was inspiring, and I was absolutely proud to be there. And I think of, of those who were interned who had one case to take with them, but they managed to get their, their baseball glove into that bag, perhaps leaving something more important behind, but they kept the baseball glove. And baseball became a part of internment, and baseball still is part and parcel of the Japanese community. I mentioned George Takei only because uh, I am a Star Trek fan, and he was filming here in British Columbia in Steveston. Uh, and uh, he was, it was a, a film called, the, or a series called The Terror, but it was founded on the internment of Japanese Americans. And George was interned as a youngster. And although I wanted to talk about Star Trek, we spent a minute or two on that. And then we spent the next hour talking about progressive politics, about uh, how do we make redress? How do we ensure that the horrors that his family lived through and the families of, of, of Aki and Mary and others who are here today and those who are no longer with us, the generational trauma which Indigenous people know so well from, from residential schools exists in this community as well. And so that is why when, uh, when we were approached uh, by uh, Lorene, uh, Susanna, uh, Suzanne and Paul, uh, we sat down and we started to work on what could a legacy package look like? What could we do to build on the work that Naomi and Adrian and the legislature did in, in 2012 to make a lasting difference? And we've come up with a package, uh, I'm proud to announce today, a hundred million dollar legacy to honor Japanese Canadians to continue the healing for generations to come. This, this endowment will not change the past, but it will ensure that generations that are with us still and those that come after will have the opportunity to see something positive coming out of what was a clearly a very, very dark period in our collective histories. The $100 million package will go towards survivors' health and wellness, which we've already started, as, uh, as uh, was mentioned by Calvin at the start of the uh, proceedings today. We're going to ensure that the curriculum reflects accurately the events of British Columbia's history, not just Japanese internment, but also the impact of residential schools, the Kamagata Maru, and a host of other racist policies that were part and parcel of the governments of British Columbia from Confederation up until well into the 1940s and indeed well into the 1960s. If we are going to never go back, we have to remember where we come from. And that means investing in education. That means ensuring that there is a monument to understanding what has happened in a physical, tangible way as a legacy for community, for culture, and for heritage preservation going forward. And in the midst of all of that, of course, will be anti-racism initiatives, because I firmly believe that our great country is a cultural mosaic. It separates us from the melting pot to the south of us. But being a mosaic is not enough. Being violently anti-racist when we see violence by coming at it with love and hope and dignity. That's what anti-racism is all about. That's what all of us want to see. So although this historic milestone is just the beginning of a new journey, it is a journey that, again, Mary has invited us to take together. Indigenous people being here since time immemorial, 
I, the son of an Irish immigrant, those who have come from other places, those who were born here for generations, all of us going together, improving the health and wellness of seniors in the Japanese community, creating and restoring heritage sites across British Columbia, updating the curriculum, making sure that it better reflects the impacts of our teachings on the generations that will come after us, and most importantly, most importantly, thinking of those shoulders that we've stood on, as Naomi so eloquently said, as Mary said, as other speakers have said, standing on the shoulders of those who came before us, standing hand in hand, wherever we may come from, whatever our, our orientation, whatever our gender, whatever our faith, wherever we want to practice who we are, we do it together, respectful, in love and hope and harmony. That's the British Columbia all of us want. That's the British Columbia I'm proud to be part of, and I know everyone in this room, everyone on uh, live streams across the province, and those who do not yet understand the full value of us living together in peace, we'll come together one day. There's always hope. Let's say that. High School CM, thank you for coming today. Thank you, Mr. Premier. I know this project has been a priority for you for a number of years, and it's wonderful to see it come to reality for, for survivors, for their families, and for all British Columbians. That concludes our formal remarks for this event, and I'd like to have all the speakers to gather here at the front for photographs. But before we do that, I'd like uh, Suzanne to come up and present a small gift to the Premier. If you would join us, uh, Premier Horgan. These are two books from our um, com uh, community reflecting our Japanese uh, food culture. The first book is a book titled Our Edible Roots, produced by Tonari Gumi. And the second book is one that I'm familiar with because I helped produce it. Uh, <laughs> from the Sea and Shore, Steve Sten's favorite Japanese Canadian recipes, and yes, they have it for sale at Tonari Gumi. <laughs> Thank you very much. And uh, we'd like to welcome back the Chibi Taiko group for their last performance. And as they get uh, ready, I would like to thank Shinobu Homa, Kai Urihara, and Cassandra Horn for uh, performing for us today.